All right. Um, thank you for the invitation. So I'm going to um, discuss today the Cuba representations over F1. So this is joint work with um, Jeon Kim and um, Alex Cisco. Oops. Um, all right. So my mathematical background is from this um, geometry over the field with one element. And um, there are two motivations um, on this um, geometry over the field with one element. The first one started with Jacques Titt when he was providing this geometric construction of an algebraic group. And what he noticed was that this um, algebraic structure of a finite field completely degenerate when Q goes to one, but the geometry that he constructed does not completely degenerate. And he suggested that this um, degenerate geometry should be um, built on mysterious field of characteristic one. And there's another motivation in algebraic geometry over F1, or sometimes people call it as an algebraic geometry under spec Z or in characteristic one. And one of driving idea here is to understand spec Z as some sort of curve over F1. But, but to do so, one has to actually work with something um, larger than categorical rings because integers is an initial object in the category of rings. So another um, application of this kind of algebraic geometry um, is to um, tropical geometry, whose algebraic side is on these idempotent semi-rings. So if you want to develop like vector bundles or um, scheme theory for tropical geometry, you will have to work with these notions of algebraic geometry over um, semi-rings. And today's talk is about cubal representations. So we're gonna go with um, the idea that vector spaces over F1 is nothing but finite point sets. And we'll see what um, um, we go with that. All right, so let me recall briefly um, the notation for cuber representation. So Q will be my cuber, which is finite directed graph, and Q0 will be vertexes, and Q1 will be arrows. And I'm going to use this notation of S of alpha as a source and T of alpha as a target. And cubal representation um, over, say, complex numbers is nothing but at each vertex, you put a vector space, a finite dimensional vector space. And each arrow, you put linear maps. And dimension vector over representation is simply you remember dimension at each vertex. And the dimension of representation is the sum of dimensions at each vertex. And sub representation is just, um, you know, at each vertex, you have a sub um, subspace. And each arrow, you have a restriction. And direct sum is at each vertex defined um, to be a direct sum. And the um, linear maps are given by this diagonal matrix. And in the composable representation means that you can not write it as a direct sum of non, um, two non-zero representations. And the Lipton representation means that if you go um, long enough, then your linear map should be um, composed um, to be zero. All right, so here's quick um, a visualization of cuber representation. If you have this um, cuber with three vertexes and two arrows, you can um, think of this representation M and it's sub-representation N. And one can easily see that the dimension factor is three, three, one. And dimension is sum of these numbers, which is seven. And it's not in the composable. You can write it as a direct sum of n and one dimensional um, sub representation. And it's nilpotent. So I'm just um, saying this because later we're going to interpret this in terms of F1 representation. And then we're going to reinterpret that in terms of um, another quiver. All right. So cubal representation over F1 here simply means the, um, or it's a combinatorial model for cubal representation over a finite field or field. It was introduced by Matt Chesney in um, 2011. And idea is pretty simple that instead of using vector spaces and linear maps, we define the category of F1 vector spaces and we use F1 vector spaces and F1 linear map to define F1 representation. So F1 vector spaces are nothing but finite pointed set. So it's quite a finite and combinatorial, but you can always move from F1 vector spaces to any ordinary vector spaces by considering this space change functor. So you can think of this F1 vector spaces is your choice of a basis in your vector space. 
So from um f one um and then this um scalar um base change functor from f one vector spaces to complex vector spaces will induce also the scalar uh, base change functor from representations. And I will explain this a bit more. So um, the category of F1 vector spaces. So objects, as I explained, um, are finite pointed sets. And dimension of an F1 vector space is cardinality minus 1, so it's non-zero elements. Um, and F1 linear maps are, are pointed set maps and with this extra condition that away from zero, the map has to be an injection. Um, now, the base change functor that I explained earlier is nothing but if you have an F1 vector space, then you can use that as a basis to define a complex vector space or vector space over any field. So that's going to be our base change functor. And the way um, McChesney defined F1 representation, again, if you have a quiver, then at each vertex, you put F1 vector space, and each arrow, you put F1 linear map. And I'm going to use this notation for the um, category of F1 representations. And there are easy um, properties that one can check. For instance, um, F1 vector spaces, uh, maps have um, corners, co-corners, and it has some sort of duality. And it has two um, symmetric monoidal structures, um, the direct sum and tensor. And F1 representation category um, also satisfies some nice conditions, such as it has um, Jordan Holder theorem and Kurt Schmidt theorem. And the home sets and extension spaces, um, those are finite sets. And that's not relevant to what I'm um, discussing today, but it's quite useful when one talk about four algebras of F1 representations. All right, so one can also put everything in a categorical way that if you have a quiver Q, then you can cook up this cate category whose objects are vertexes and morphism subpasses. And then F1 representation is nothing but a functor from this category to F1 vector spaces. And the category of F1 representations is going to be now the functor category. And then the base change functor can be seen in this way because um, um, cubal representation of a field can be also seen as a, a functor and um, F1 representation to um, complex representation is go through this um, composition. All right, so now the main questions, if I do something like this, I think in F1 geometry, there are two types of questions that people ask. So if you develop this theory, then can you use this idea to say something about classical structure? So in this case, can you use this F1 representation to say something about um, cubal representations over a field? And another type of question that one can ask is that if you develop this theory um, parallel to the classical theory, then are there any statements analogous to the statement over a field? So specifically what I'm going to discuss today so the um, two sort of, um, be, um, it belongs to the first type of question. So I'm going to discuss the Euler characteristic of cubo Grassmannians. And then to answer uh, or the second type of question, I'm going to discuss um, classification of quivers um, that's inspired by this same wild dichotomy in representation theory. All right. So to um, explain a bit more on this Euler characteristic, so cubo Grassmannian is defined in this way that you fix a representation and you fix a dimension vector. Then the cubo Grassmannian obtained from this data is the collection of um, sub-representations with this prescribed um, dimension vector. Then one can easily see that just ordinary Grassmannian is your cubo Grassmannian with the quiver, which is the simplest quiver one can think of, which is just one vertex. And the representation is just a fine space of dimension n. And cubo um, Grassmannian is a closed subset of a finite product of Grassmannian, so it's a um, projective variety. But at the same time, Reinecke showed that every projective variety is actually a cubo Grassmannian. So, you know, at glance, it looks very limited, but at the end of the day, um, you know, cubo Grassmannians are the same as projective varieties. 
And there are um, papers um, trying to give combinatorial formula for Euler characteristics of Cuba Grassmannians. So there is paper by Cheruli Irelli and um, um, about string modules. And um, his technique was um, further developed by Hopt, um, talk about tree modules and band modules. And there are other um, work like Rochite. And one quick observation that people could make is that many of these representations, tree modules, string modules, or band modules, those are defined over F1, meaning that you could define F1 representation whose scalar extension or base chains are those modules. So if we go back to the Grassmannian case, then if we define F1 rational point of Grassmannian as a limit of um, um, rational point over a finite field FQ, the limit Q goes to one, then one has this number and choose M, which is exactly the Euler characteristic of um, Grassmannian of, um, over um, complex numbers. So a uh, more specific question that we ask here is that, is there a way to compute the Euler characteristic of Cuba Grassmannian just like the Grassmannians? If so, can you find an explicit combinatorial formula to do the job? All right, and the second type of question that I um, explained or uh, inspired by this tame wild dichotomy is that, um, you know, there are two types of um, representations. Um, one is the tame and the remaining things are wild. And the question is that, is there something similar in the world of F1 representations? So two types of questions. One could have direct application to um, classical structures. Second one is just um, inspired by classical theorem and what can you do with those um, theorems? All right, so in either question, there is this combinatorial gadget that we use, which we call um, coefficient quivers. Um, at the beginning of our project, when um, Alex and I were um, working on this, we actually called um, colored quivers, but then referee pointed out that the um, object that we're considering was pretty much similar to what Ringel called as um, coefficient quivers. So we had to change our names. So idea is very simple. So if you have this quiver with a single vertex, say um, two arrows, alpha one and alpha two, and we can think of this F1 representations, so F1 vector spaces consists of um, four points, zero, one, two, three. And I'm attaching these two F1 linear maps. Then one can visualize this F1 representations Namely, you can think of vertexes consisting of non-zero element in F1 vector spaces, and you color arrows in such a way that, so these blues, blue ones are from this F alpha one, and the red ones are from F alpha two. So originally at the beginning, you colored um, vertexes and arrows by using vertexes and arrows of Q, but then this information can be also encoded by using this structure map. So if you look at this gamma M as another quiver, then this red one goes to um, um, alpha two because it came from F of alpha two. And this B1 and B2, these guys go to um, alpha one. And every vertex here, one, two, three, goes to this single vertex. So, um, to make it more precise, if you have an F1 representation, then you have a bunch of F1 vector spaces and F1 linear map. And the way that you cook up this coefficient quiver is that you look at all non-zero um, elements in um, these F1 vector spaces. So they are going to be your vertexes and you draw an arrow between two vertexes um, in this coefficient quiver whenever you can find some arrow in your queue so that whose target um, source is B and target is W. And you can find this from attached F1 vector spaces and F1 linear map does this thing. So it's just like what we um, saw in the previous example. And the structure map um, is defined in this way that each vertex of coefficient quiver goes to where it belongs. So if this vertex X was from this um, F1 vector space MB, 
then equals to this vertex and linear map is pretty much likewise. So I think I have another example, yeah. So if you have this quiver Q, so three vertexes, V1, V2, and V3, and three arrows, alpha, beta, and gamma. And I can think of this F1 representations. I'm putting um, this um, MV1, MV2, and MV3 at each vertex. So a uh, finite pointed sets. And my linear maps, uh, uh, F1 linear maps are defined in this way. So at alpha, I attach this R, um, F alpha sending A to X and F beta sends um, B to X and F gamma send X to Y, Y to Z and Z to zero. So from here, one can easily, well, one can check that dimension vector here is one, one, three and dimension is five. And this F1 representation is in decomposable and it's near potent. And we will make it clear this um, after a um, couple of slides when we translate, again, properties of F1 representation in terms of um, coefficient quivers. All right, so likewise, we can do the same thing. If I give a color um, on um, vertex B1, um, black, and vertex B2, uh, red, um, vertex B3, um, um, blue, and also if I color um, arrows, then we get this coefficient quiver and based on this coloring, you can have this structure map. So same color goes to, so this green goes to green, red goes to red, and the orange goes to orange, and likewise the vertexes. So um, this uh, map that I code as a structure map is actually a map of directed graph or a quiver map. And it actually is something more what people call as a windings. So winding is a very specific quiver map satisfying this condition that if you have two different um, arrows and if they go to the same thing, then these arrows alpha and beta should have a different source and different um, target. And what it proved at the beginning is that what uh, Matt Chesney called as an F1 representation is precisely this winding. Well, meaning that if you have an F1 representation, then you cook up this coefficient quiver with this structure map, and that's gonna give us a winding. And if you forget about anything on F1 representation, and if you start with a um, winding, then you can construct an F1 representation from winding, which is unique of isomorphism in such a way that whose coefficient quiver is the one that you started with. So this is the comment that I made. Um, the idea is um, pretty much um, similar to um, coefficient quivers by Ringel. All right, so one can translate properties of F1 representations to um, coefficient quivers. That's what I um, explained earlier. So everything is at this point is um, combinatorics. So if you have an F1 representation, then representation being nilpotent is same as coefficient being um, acyclic, and um, representation being in decomposable is um, coefficient quiver being connected, and any sub representation is a successor closed sub quiver of this coefficient quiver. And one can say a bit more that this um, under this correspondence, the representation over F1 category is equivalent to the um, category of quivers to Q. All right, so now going back to the Euler characteristic. So if you have this quiver consisting of a single vertex and with this representation, then Grassmannian is quiver, um, quiver Grassmannian. And if you actually count number of sub representations of this M whose dimension is R, then this counting is exactly N choose R, which was what we saw. And that's exactly the Euler characteristic of Cuber Grassmannian in this case. So the question goes, um, can you do the same thing as in Grassmannian that Euler characteristic is number of F1 rational points of um, Cuber Grassmannian? So meaning that can you count something um, in a meaningful way to compute um, Euler characteristic? So um, types of theorems that we um, try to find is that if you have an F1 representation with um, some extra condition, then for any fixed dimension factor D, 
um, the Euler characteristic of Cuba Grassmannian is the same as number of sub representations of this F1 representation with the prescribed um, dimension vector. So essentially, we um, use the idea of Cherry Lely and Haupt. Uh, all uh, we did here is to translate their language in terms of F1 representations. And in their proof, the main ingredient is the notion of gradings of representations. So um, um, what it means by a grading is simply a function from vertexes of um, quiver to integers. And there, there are some technical conditions. I think I should have put the um, third bullet point first. So nice grading means that um, if you have um, C, um, which C here is the structure map. So if your structure map send two arrows to the same arrow, then this um, grading should satisfy this condition. And nice grading is a sequence of gradings which also satisfy some condition. And these are the ones which induce torus action on Cuba Grassmannians. And essentially what you do is just um, count the number of uh, fixed points under this torus action. All right, so this is an example of nice grading. Um, so if you have Q, L2 is um, a quiver with two loops. And I'm gonna say alpha one and alpha two um, to be my um, arrows. And if I think of this uh, for representations given by this coefficient quiver, then this is nice grading because if you look at this guy and this guy, they map to the same thing. So difference here should be the same. So it's one and one. Here, this guy and this guy go to same um, arrow alpha two. So difference here and here should be the same. And we can think of another grading, which is um, um, round zero nice grading round one, and which you can check um, later that this is also nice grading following um, the definition of the previous slide. All right, so um, the propositions that um, we were able to prove is that if you have an F1 representation equipped with um, this nice grading with an extra condition that if you choose any two vertexes in your coefficient quiver, and then if you have an um, round eye so that it can distinguish these two vertexes, then you can always do this counting of um, Cuba Grassmannian Euler characteristics. So under this assumption that Euler characteristic of Cuba Grassmannian is always same as the number of F1 sub representations of this uh, F1 representation M with this fixed dimension factor. Then we actually studied more. So the um, case of three modules and band modules were proved by Haupt. And what it focused was the case when quiver is um, prop, um, pseudo tree, which is simply means that it's just like a tree, but it has one cycle. Um, and I guess this is actually nice proposition. Um, so this is types of um, um, theorems that we proved. So if you're Q, is the quiver with three loops, um, um, alpha, beta, and gamma. And if this gamma m is the coefficient quiver, and um, one of our propositions says that if you can find some nice sub quivers or nice cycles, so in this case here, um, x1, here, x2, and if these colors, so this um, alpha, which are blue, and beta, which are red, and gamma, which are black, and if these are all connected with some extra condition, then you can also do the sub-representation counting to do um, um, Euler characteristics. So in this case, for instance, if your dimension factor is one, then essentially what you find here is the sink. So there are two sinks here, one is here and the other one is here. So I don't know what the cubo Grassmannian here in this case, but I can say for sure in this case, the Euler characteristic of this cubo Grassmannian is two which simply is the number of sync. And if dimension factor is two, then what we do um, are two cases. So we look at in decomposable representations or um, direct sum of simples. So we have this simples. So we have one of them and we have um, three. So here, oops, here's one and here's another and here's another. 
So we have three um, two-dimensional in decomposable representations. So Euler characteristic in this case is four. So these are types of theorems that we proved, but essentially idea goes to um, the Cherlu Irelli and Haupt um, um, technique. All right, so now um, move to the second type of question on classification of quivers um, inspired by this tame wild dichotomy. So to do the job, we introduce this cross function counting number of isomorphism classes of n dimensional in decomposable represent um mil potent representations. And um, with this function, we define this pre-order between two cubers. So q is less than or equal to q prime when this counting function can be written as this big O notation for some um, natural number y. And this induces an equivalence relation uh, on the set of um, quivers, namely two quivers uh, equivalent if and only if one is less than or equal to the other and the other way around. So they somehow have um, same growth rate. Okay. So now um, we define the representation types over F1. So we say that um, F1 representation has finite representation type um, if there are only finitely many isomorphism classes of indecomposables in um, nilpotent representation category. And we say it's bounded representation type if with the um, order that I introduced in previous slide, um, it's bounded by the Jordan quiver or L1, that's our notation. And the last type, we say that quiver is um, has unbounded representation type over F1 unless otherwise. And based on this, um, in our uh, um, second paper with Alex, we proved that we can classify quiver almost um, all of them. So if I write ln with a quiver with one vertex and n loops, then uh, one can prove that they are not equivalent. L0, so it's just single vertex, and Jordan quiver and two loops, they are not equivalent. And Lm and Ln are equivalent as long as the smallest number is greater than or equal to two. So this is similar to the um, wild case. And um, um, quiver is equivalent to this um, single vertex if and only if quiver is three, if and only if um, it has finite representation type and it's equivalent to the Jordan quiver, if and only if it's a cycle quiver or a n tilde or a fine um, um, quiver of type a n or it has bounded representation type, but it's not finite. And finally, um, any representation or any quiver Q is bounded by L2, two loop quivers, and then each equivalent to L2 if and only if. So you look at quiver as a graph and you can look at it as a simple shell complex. You can compute H1. And if rank of the H1 is greater than or equal to two, or in terms of cycle spaces, your um, underlying graph of your quiver has um, rank greater than or equal to two, then each equivalent to L2. So that's our previous work. And then what, um, yeah, um, some key ideas of the proof is pretty much, uh, I, I think, um, a typical thing that we um, introduce these functors. Um, yeah. So, right. All right, so what we were not able to prove was the case of pseudo tree keepers. So we knew what um, um, single vertex is, and we knew what um, the keepers with um, rank greater than or equal to um, two does, but we didn't know the case when keeper has exactly one cycle. And with Jeon Kim, we were able to prove that if you have a proper pseudo tree, which means that it's a pseudo tree or unicyclic graph, which is not a tree, then it's always equivalent to this specific um, quiver, which has two vertexes and one loop. 
So idea is um, fairly straightforward. We use coefficient keywords and we literally use recursion to count. So how does it work? So if I give you some visualization, so let's say this keyword is QT, we have one loop and we attach um, tree T. And then the coefficient quiver of n dimensional in decomposer representation of this QT will look like this. So this oriented uh, path um, bottom from, um, it comes from this loop and these TIs, these are uh, rooted subtrees of this T and total number of vertexes appearing in this coefficient quiver is precisely N because we are looking at N dimensional representation. And um, we're going to need this number four later when it write down the recursion. So um, this capital S sub K is the set of rooted subtrees of T consisting of exactly K vertexes and small K, um, small S K, we use it as the cardinality. Now, um, you know, if you think of what you can attach, say if you give names from here on, uh, from the left to the right, if you only consider the last vertex, then based on how um, which subtrees are attached at the last vertex, you can cook up this recursion. So total number of um, um, representation should be the when last one is a single vertex, when last one has two vertexes, three vertexes, and so on. So you have this recursion and from which you can uh, obtain this polynomial. And from here, if C is a root of this polynomial with maximal absolute value, then one can prove that this function in big O notation is actually this. And that's pretty much the idea. You, uh, you know, we have uh, specific types of um, pseudo tree we look at how coefficient quivers should look like, we cook up recursion and we count. Likewise here, if you have this pseudo tree with EQ oriented central cycle, then the coefficient quiver looks like this. And we cook up a recursion, which is a bit more complicated than previous one, but one can solve those um, recursion in the same way and conclude that this actually has the same um, um, growth function. And case of acyclic central cycle is a bit more complicated. So uh, they, the way we were able to prove is that we first look at this set containing exactly one representative of each isomorphism classes of um, n-dimensional in decomposable object in this near photon representation category. And when it comes to this acyclic or when it comes to a proper pseudo tree, we proved in the previous paper that coefficient quivers are two types. It could be either tree, which is this, or it could be um, um, a pseudo tree, proper pseudo tree. So if you, um, you know, for, um, fix one representative from each isomorphism classes, then you can decompose this set into the tree um, and proper pseudo trees. And then the case when, um, case of this part, um, the tree part, one can show that this is actually same as um, in big O notation, is same as C to the N for some um, real number C greater than one. This is um, because we use this idea that if you have a proper pseudo tree Q with a cyclic central cycle, then you can reverse um, this cycle arrow one by one. And you can show that by each um, revert, um, reversing an arrow, you can have the same um, number of um, representations. And then if you reverse all of them, then you go back to the case of EQ oriented central cycle um, from which you get this result. And then you can show that actually number of uh, proper pseudo tree representations is smaller than tree representations. And then it conclude that um, even in even in the case of a cyclic central cycle, you get the same thing as in EQ oriented cycle. All right. So likewise, in the case of two loop quivers, we also do the same thing. We enumerate and we look at coefficient quivers, and we count the smallest possible way in this case when you have two loop quivers, and we prove that the um, the cross function in big O notation is at least this big. 
which means that you know this is strictly bigger than any proper pseudo trees. So we complete our um, classification that um, when you have connected quiver Q, then um, um, then this Q should be equivalent to one of the following four um, quivers. So if it's finite type, then it's a single vertex or tree. And if it's bounded type, then it says um, um, Jordan quiver. And if it's um, the rank of H1 is greater than or equal to two, then it's equivalent to these two loop keepers. And then if rank is one or proper pseudo tree, then it's equivalent to this guy. So yeah, I mean, we proved this, but I, I, I guess we don't know where to use. I think it's aesthetically um, amusing, but then, uh, yeah. All right, so. I guess I went too fast. I usually go fast in my talk, but there are a um, story that I completely missed in this um, presentation is the whole algebra in this F1 um, geometry setting. So Chesney in the same paper also introduced the whole algebra of F1 representations. And this whole algebra is the universal enveloping algebra of its resub algebra of um, primitive elements in terms of um, coefficient keepers. Primitive elements are just connected coefficient keepers. And I think this one is what um, Alex and I focused in our previous papers that um, to cook up whole algebra, you need to study how exact sequences are cooked up. And in terms, in terms of coefficient quivers, if you have an exact sequence, then in terms of coefficient quivers, so this middle guy can be obtained by using these coefficient quivers of N and L, and you properly glue those. So you look at um, the um, gamma N and gamma L, and you add more arrows by using the um, um, colored by um, quiver Q. Um, and then um, Chesney proved various theorem showing that um, this whole algebra can be viewed as a um, combinatorial version on um, Q equals one of the whole algebra associated to the representation of quiver over a finite field. And also I think um, two main examples of whole algebras are from uh, one from quiver representation, another from coherent shifts on uh, projective varieties. And uh, Matt, I, I worked with Matt Chesney. So um, whole algebra computation in algebraic geometry is actually quite difficult. Even in the case of a projective plane, the computation was not completely done. And our idea here was to use this combinatorial um, model of um, mo monoid schemes and study coherent shifts on these monoid schemes and whole algebras to understand the whole algebra for the projective plane. But this is still ongoing. And this whole idea is based on this work of, um, we realized this later, that based on this kaplanov dikov um, the framework of a proto-abelian and proto-exec categories. So if you have a finitely proto-abelian or proto-exec categories, then you can always cook up whole algebras. And I think this framework is very nice to cook up whole algebras out of um, any category consisting of um, object like um, combinatorial object. In one of our um, previous work was on this constructing whole algebra out of um, category of Metroid. And it happens to be the same as Metroid minor hope algebra. And then another aspect of this kaplanov dikov um, story is that you can do the K theory out of this um, proto abelian or proto exec categories. Um, all right, so I, I brought an example showing how abelian category case and this proto abelian category case um, computation um, can be done. So if you have a finite dimensional vector spaces, then your whole algebra underlying set looks like this. So it's spanned by isomorphism classes of your category. And then multiplication is given by um, counting um, the um, number of equivalent exact sequences or in this finite dimensional vector space case, what you do is that you simply count the um, number of um, um, points in the Grassmannian over FQ. So these are sort of the number that you 
uh, we see previously. And as an um, algebra, this whole algebra is isomorphic to this guy, where isomorphism is obtained by sending any n-dimensional vector space to this guy. Now, this is classical version of um, abelian category. And now in the proto-abelian category case is pretty much the same. Now, if we have f1 vector spaces, then any object or n-dimensional object looks like this. So again, underlying um, set of the whole algebra in this case is just penned by um, isomorphism classes. And multiplication, again, is, I, I think this is strictly speaking, we are counting short exact sequences as well, but I didn't really have time to um, introduce that here. But the counting is pretty much the same as the Grassmannian case, and it goes exactly n plus m choose n. And isomorphism here um, of this um, case, the whole algebra is given by sending this um, n-dimensional f1 vector spaces to this guy. And you can compare the previous one and this one and this um, the um, f1 vector space case exactly is when q equals one. All right, so yeah, I guess I went too fast. I thank you. Thank and you. Very these much. are references. Uh -huh. Thank you. Very Sorry, nice when I was preparing, when I was preparing the poem, I I I I I went over by myself, and I it it I, it, it took more than like fifty minutes, one on hours. So I was like, oh yeah, I should go fast, and then I I think this time I went too fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you very much. Um, 